Okay, so I'm gonna be honest, I have been a little behind on videos for the slow car fast project. If you remember, I had set a pretty absurd deadline to have this car running for the first El Mirage event of the year, which is today. And while it's technically impossible for me to have this car running by today, don't count me out. The goal of today was actually a bit of a trick I played on myself. You see, projects like this always take longer than you plan them to. So if I plan to be done by Bonneville Speed Week, I won't be. But if I plan to be done by today, I might have it done by Speed Week. But since it is today and it's not done, now I'm thinking it won't be done in time for Speed Week in August. It may never be running. I might die an old man with a half-finished rusted mess of a car in my decaying garage, still posting videos on YouTube years after everyone else has moved on to TikTok and then Byte, and then GeoCities. No, that's quitter talk. I will have it running. I will have it running this week, going hundreds of miles per hour and breaking records in my driveway. Or somewhere in between those two possibilities. When I left you last, I had mostly designed and built my rear suspension and mostly designed and built my front suspension, so I should be close to a rolling chassis the rolling chassis is a huge milestone for any car, and I expected mine to happen a while ago. I have the suspension, and I have the frame, and that's all you need, but there were a few little things here and there causing problems, so I moved on to other things. The plan was to get the car rolling, and then finish welding it, and then take it apart and paint it, but I decided to go ahead and weld it up and paint it. If I were a lesser YouTuber, I would insert a 5 minute time lapse of me welding up a chassis, but I'm not going to do that to you. Just know there was a lot of welding. And then some painting. I decided to go with this Steel It paint that many of you suggested. It seems to be a durable paint that you can apparently weld over. I hope so, because it's pretty expensive and one can does not go very far. Anyway, let's put the motor in. The first thing I had to do was shorten this obnoxiously tall oil pan. Modern sport bikes seem to all have these tall skinny oil pans. I had to shorten the oil pan in the original engine in the S600 by welding it. You might remember that I tried to weld it with aluminum filler only to realize that it was magnesium. Anyway, this BMW one is also magnesium, but it does seem to be a different alloy. The old pan welded just fine, but I had some trouble with the BMW pan. By the way, if you do this, you should definitely have a Class D fire extinguisher since a normal one won't put out a magnesium fire. I don't have one, but I did have a pair of pliers handy, so if it caught on fire, I could quickly throw it into my neighbor's yard. Anyway, nothing caught fire, at least not until I made magnesium shavings and burned those. Neat. But like I said, this pan did not want to weld, and it looked like garbage, but I did hit it with a hammer a few times to make sure it was solid. It's probably fine. The motor went in with the help of a friend. We did this with a 4x4 wood post and I have decided to go ahead and buy that engine hoist that I should have bought a long time ago because it would have made this a lot easier and it will make it easier to get the car off the table in the future. So here's something kind of dumb. After installing the engine in my S600 with the very long bolts that go all the way through the engine, I noticed that I can't actually get to the top bolt in the BMW engine going into the land speed car. The long bolt can't get past the frame, so I drilled out a hole through this tube and the angled tube, and then I cut some round tube and welded it in so I could get a bolt through the engine. Then I realized the engine is threaded. It's not one long bolt, it's two short bolts. So, uh, that was a waste of time. The rear of the engine is bolted to these laser cut plates that Send Cut Send made for me. These also hold the swing arm. I like this design. It's neatly all tied together. The front upper mounts are attached through the frame rails. I welded in some round tube and countersunk it so I could get flathead bolts out here since the body is very close to this. The whole engine is shifted to the right to get the chain to the rear end without using an intermediate jack shaft. This will limit drivetrain losses, but it does get the engine real close to the right side frame. Real close. Super close. The motorcycle originally came with a 525 chain and a 525 front sprocket, but I'm going to bump that up to 530 because it's easier to get low friction racing chains in that size. The original front sprocket has 17 teeth. I'd like to have a few gearing options and that's going to be easier if I can put bigger sprockets on the front, but it's very tight in here. So I bought a couple of sprockets, an 18 tooth and a 19 tooth. The 18 will fit with the chain. It's a little tight, but not unreasonable. With the 19, the chain straight up does not fit. So we'll say that 18 is the maximum front sprocket size. 
The rear sprockets I had custom made. I had these laser cut out to size and then I chucked them up in the lathe and put the chamfer on the teeth. I made these split sprockets so I could change the rear sprocket without removing this whole left rear assembly, but with where the bolts go, I can't actually access them anyway, so it doesn't matter. Some of you are noticing that the sprocket is real close to the frame back here. I noticed that too. This is what happens when you add things without putting them in CAD first, so I'll have to cut that out, bend it back a little bit, and re-weld it. You might remember that my frame is split into two right behind the driver. Well, the frame went back together and I added some extra fastening features here. Last time, several people were worried that this connection wouldn't be strong enough, and some people were concerned that the frame wouldn't bolt back together square. I do think that this connection is strong enough. Breaking it would require shearing four grade eight bolts that are all in double shear, but when I get enough comments telling me the same thing, I start to think that maybe I'm not the knower of all things that one would expect of a YouTuber of my stature. Also, it does look kind of wimpy. So I added a welded plate on the inside, and then I cut these tube sections and bolted them together at each node. This gives me a positive locating feature in all three dimensions at all corners. It also adds the strength of eight extra fasteners. They're not huge, but it is something. The rear end went together as expected after some hammering and strong profanity. I wanted the height of each side to be the same so that my corner weights would all be good, but the right side was a little bit higher than the left. I had designed in shims to adjust this, but not enough. I'm off by about half of a millimeter. Half a millimeter doesn't sound like a lot, and it's not. It actually doesn't matter. I could add a tiny bit of air pressure to the other tire to make up for it, or just not care since I'll be driving on dirt and packed salt. Anyway, it's not perfect, but I'm just going to not tell anybody. And if you don't tell anybody, then nobody will know. I think I mentioned this before, but if not, this is how the brake rotors are mounted. The wheel studs go through the wheel flange, but they also clamp down this steel piece and this aluminum piece. Inside this aluminum piece are some captured lock nuts. The other aluminum spacer has holes to clear the heads of the wheel studs. The brake rotor bolts through that aluminum spacer and into these lock nuts. This spaces out the brake rotor from the wheel the appropriate amount. Typically, you would use a brake hat for this, but these plates package everything a little bit better. The calipers bolt to the swing arm using these little brackets at the bottom. My suspension setup here is honestly kind of dumb. I have this bell crank thing transmitting the up force from the swing arm into a down force on the shocks. I made this by laser cutting three plates of steel and just welding the perimeter together. I did this because it was super easy to have send cut send laser it out for me and I didn't really have room for shocks anywhere else. I added some adjustability in here, but even in the softest setting, I am way oversprung probably over damp too. I might just ditch these shocks and put in some quarter midget shocks. Can I say quarter midget? Am I going to get demonetized for that? Anyway, it's so stiff that it's essentially locked out, which is good enough for now. The bell crank is connected to the swing arm with these rod end turnbuckles. These will allow me to adjust the ride height. I love rod end turnbuckles. They look great. They're also easy to make and you can make them in all sizes. Just buy a couple of rod ends and get these weld in threaded tube ends. You can get these in several different sizes of inch and metric and right hand, left hand, stainless. Just cut some tube to length and weld them in. There are 11 of these things currently on this car, most of them in the steering. There are four that we're talking about today, two on the rear suspension and these two triangulating the rear of the frame. I talked about these before. I don't know how stiff this car is going to be. It could act like a giant upside down leaf spring flexing in the middle. I didn't do any actual engineering on this, but my engineering intuition tells me that adding these will significantly increase the stiffness of the car. So we'll just assume I'm right. These are just using clevises on the ends. I welded a tab onto the frame and bolted them in. The rear ones here are real close to where the body will be. So I countersunk the clevis and used a flathead bolt. I installed a fuel tank. This was super easy. I just bought one for a drag racing car, welded in a couple of rectangular tubes, and bolted it in with some spacers. This will probably only ever be half filled. Less fuel is better because I don't want to be on fire. Speaking of not being on fire, the fire suppression system came in. I haven't installed these yet, but they will go here-ish? I also added the rectifier so I can charge the battery with the engine. I pretty much just put this in because I had it. I might want to deactivate this at wide open throttle so it's not sucking power when I need it the most, maybe with a relay on the outlet. I don't know, I'll figure that out later. I also have this guy. This is a heat exchanger. Water goes in here and out here. Engine coolant goes in here and out here. And inside the heat is transferred from the hot engine coolant to the cold water. This way I can have my water tank up front filled with just regular room temperature water. It will get hotter as the engine heats up, but it's never going to be as hot as the engine coolant and the tank doesn't need to be pressurized. I'm not sure how well this will work. I suppose I could do some thermal engineering, but I think I'm just going to stick temperature sensors on the outlets and see how well it works. I got a pump for it. Also not sure how well this will work, but we'll find out. 
I did make a header for this guy. It is currently pointing at the rear tire, which is not only a bad idea, but also specifically forbidden in the rules. I will be adding another tube that goes up and out the back like this. The headers were pretty straightforward. These parts are just round heavy wall tube I made on the lathe. These flanges are courtesy of Send Cut Send. I bought the tubes and collector parts from Cone Engineering. These guys are great for this sort of stuff, as long as you don't mind navigating a website that was designed during the Bush administration. To get the right tube length and bends, I threw a collector in CAD and just drew some 3D sketches connecting the exhaust outlets to the collector. I knew the bend radius on the tube would be 3 inches, so I drew all the lines with a 3 inch radius, then I adjusted all the lengths until all the tubes cleared each other and were all pretty much the same. I'm trying to maximize peak horsepower, so I dug up some exhaust primary length equations in an old book I had. That gave me a number that was in the ballpark of what I already had, so I called it good. I did a bunch of dyno testing on different header lengths a long time ago when it was all within the repeat ability of our dyno. It wasn't a great dyno, but it did leave me with the impression that there are bigger fish to fry. My plan for this car was always to go for the smallest engine class, which is 500cc, which is only two of these cylinders. So why am I making a header for all four? Well, at some point I might want to run the full one liter class and it's not much harder to just make a full header, so I did. Honestly, I'll probably run the full engine the first couple of times I go out just to shake down the car before I go into the engine and start messing with the valve train. I got this template to get the right angle cut on the tube. It's not as good as laser cut tubes, but it's not bad. I did have to do some modifications to get all the tubes to line up once the collector was welded on. I had to take the header off the car and finish welding the collector, which moved a couple of the tubes a little bit more than I liked. Some of you smarty pants commenters are going to tell me that I should have flipped the header upside down, bolted it to the engine, and then finished welding the collector. This is an excellent idea, except I can't do that. The flanges have cutouts for the engine casting, and BMW has their bolt pattern set up so it won't bolt on upside down. Yeah, you're not so smart now, are you? Anyway, that's a lot. I did a lot. I am perhaps spending too much time building the car and not enough time making videos about the car, especially considering that the money for the car comes from the videos. And we haven't even talked about all this stuff up here, but we'll talk about that next time, along with the intake I still need to make, the ECU I still need to wire, should probably get a seatbelt. Maybe I should leave the garage and do, like, life stuff. What do people do when they're not in the garage? I suppose I'll never know. If you like the video, don't forget to hit that thumbs up. If you like Super Fast Matt, there is now a Discord, so click that link in the description, join, tell us about your projects, ask smart questions, ask dumb questions, or just stop by and say hi.